As the gold rush began to spread inland to Oregon and Idaho, you had an influx of Chinese laborers. And these people were wildly unpopular with the regular prospectors because they were willing to work for lower wages, longer hours, and they complained less. And also they were very easily identifiable. So the Chinese would often form their own communities. And a race war essentially happened here at the border with Idaho and Oregon in 1886. So yeah, so the story with the mass weaver for gold is there was three or four ranchers, hands, going, and they knew about a group of Chinese that was working down in the canyon. They decided one day for something to do, they were going to go visit the Chinese, see what was going on, and one thing led to another, but basically they were going to rob the Chinese, and that's all they were going to do. But one of the Chinese started fighting back, Violence ensued, and they shot a couple of the Chinese. Well, they didn't want witnesses, and so they went ahead and massacred one full group. There was actually two groups, two parties of Chinese miners in that canyon. The first group um, that they came across, that's the ones that they were going to rob, killed everyone there. Then the second group that was further down the river heard this, and so they came up, saw what happened, and the ranchers shot the rest of them. And so that's what led to the massacre. And, but the massacre was not found out about until the next spring, because this happened like late fall, early winter. And how they knew about it is some of the locals in the town downstream saw, started seeing bodies floating down with the ice pack and the spring melt. And so they started going up to see what happened and they found all these Chinese that were just shot and left for dead. And eventually they found out who it was. There was a trial and the men were, were, were released. And what was the, about how many died? I want to say it was like 37, 38. The story goes that Lewiston, Idaho had a huge Chinatown, a huge community of Chinese people. And so a party organizes and sends out a sort of joint expedition down the Snake River into Hell's Canyon. And it's led by Che Po and Shi Li. And they both go down separate distances. And Che Po sets up a camp at a place called Doug's Bar. Now they're probably thinking, you know, it's called Doug's Bar because they've dug it. But they had walked into the setting of a horror film because Doug's Bar was named for Thomas Douglas. And Thomas Douglas was an infamous cattle thief. In fact, he, he would steal horses and cattle, and specifically that area around Doug's Bar is where he would graze the horses which he stole. And stealing horses from travelers back in the day, that meant that you were a marked man. You could be shot on sight. And that's exactly what happened. In 1883, Thomas Douglas was shot, and that led to one of the pioneers of this area, a man by the name of Old Blue, or Bruce Evans, he took up the reins, and it became more of an organized gang. Whereas, whereas uh, Thomas Douglas was kind of just a lone outlaw, under Old Blue it became a gang. And the Chinese under Chapo did not know that they had set up a half a mile away from the cabin that this gang used to rob these miners and prospectors along the Snake River. And so essentially the story goes that they descended from the bluffs and began trying to steal the gold from this camp of Chinese miners. And one of them put up a fight. And they began firing down, and they realized they couldn't leave any witnesses. And there was also a lot of racial motivation here, because it was pretty much a given that you could kill Chinese miners, and nothing would happen to you. So I believe it was more racially motivated, as well as the ones in Rock Springs, Wyoming, which we'll get to in a moment. But anyway, they began shooting and eventually ran out of ammunition. And in fact, the last person in that camp was killed with a rock. Their bodies were dumped in the river, and quickly these pioneers realized there was another camp of them just down the way. So they went back to their cabin, they restocked, and they went and killed between eight and a dozen, we don't know how many, 
people in the camp further down the river. And they tried keeping silent about it, but in mid-1887, bodies began washing down the river, and it was already a commonly known fact amongst the Chinese that this party didn't return back to Lewiston, and they were feeling really nervous because this is the Snake River, Idaho, in the dead of winter. So even if they weren't massacred, they would have died of exposure anyway. So the whole community here knew kind of what happened. And then when bodies started floating down the river, once the water had thawed and the ice was gone, they were found to have brutal mutilation all over their body. They were filled with bullet holes and it's conjectured that they might have been tortured, although the rapids could have done the same. It was a very turbulent part of the river. Here you have the remains of a bit of a modern Chinese temple, and I'll give a little bit more of their history in just a second, because this is, was actually for a while their graveyard, and the bodies were mostly repatriated back to China, although I've been told they believe that many more could be buried here. And rather than decry these actions, the media said it was a dire warning to all Chinamen in the area. And they were trying to make it a race war because that is desperately what they wanted. They wanted this to be a race war. And in communities like this one, you would have Chinese people probably praying at the shrine behind me, one of the few intact Chinese shrines left out on the high desert of Oregon. And I can think, it's, it's just amazing to think that of the 34 Chinese people who died, they left behind dozens of families grieving their fathers. And to think of the people coming out here and praying at the shrine, and to give a little bit more detail, this community had Chinese immigrants from about the 1880s with the gold rush to the 1940s, but eventually the Chinese exclusion laws were passed and through acts of violence over the years, these communities of Chinese people, which were some of the largest in the country, gradually dwindled until you had basically nobody or no families at least left from the original influx of immigrants. And in traditional Chinese beliefs and customs, it's considered incredibly, incredibly important to have your body buried in your homeland. So you'll find that even though China was going through very tough times, during the 1940s they were dealing with the World War in ways that were in a lot of ways much tougher than you would see in Europe, they managed to get the bodies buried behind me brought back to China. And you can still see the depressions left in the ground where the bones were returned to their families and they maintained really decent records amongst the Chinese that still lived here so that they knew who to return them to. And it's said that there's additional 67 graves up on the hill in the sagebrush up there. And I think that it's interesting how few Chinese people are still left buried out here, even though probably about, I've heard estimates of a third of the population in some of these mining towns were Chinese. And yet, Almost 100% of them were returned to China, even when they were going through very tough times economically. You can see there are two indents left from where Chinese people would have been buried. They were later brought back to China. And these indents are actually everywhere. You can see one long ways right here. I hope it kind of shows up on the camera a ditch right there, another one right over here, and up on the hill, I'm just going to walk, here's another one. And we don't know where everybody is buried, but I have heard there are efforts to locate the remainders, because we know that people are buried here, we don't know their precise location, but they're going to try to find them eventually in the next few years. And you can see here, 67 more. I think it's pretty interesting that Chinese people would generally stick together. They have dozens of different dialects of language. So when a prominent member of their community would come to a place like Baker City, the rest of the community would migrate with them. And most of these people were later reburied in Kwangtung province. And I'm trying to keep this video more focused on the history of the Chinese here in America, but I did want to include a little bit of information about the Guangdong province. Nowadays it's called the Guangdong province, 
but this was at the 1940s, from 1919 to 1945, this province would have seen some of the worst war crimes of World War II, and that's because they called it the Kwangtung Least Territory. After the Rusho Japanese War, the Japanese essentially said, we own this territory now, we got it from the Qing Empire, and now it's ours and we're leasing it to you for the Manchurian Railway. And the army there was some of the most vicious security contractors. It was a sort of minor subset, a elite battalion of the Japanese Imperial Army, and it was this army which was involved with Unit 731. Now, I cannot go into the history of Unit 731. It would take an entire YouTube channel and you wouldn't even scratch the surface. But understand, Unit 731 is the idea of the color gray personified. That is the best example I've heard of it. I believe of the 20 people that were assigned to investigate the war crimes that took place there, the majority of them killed themselves. It was involved with brutal human experimentation and it seemed to be just for the hell of it half the time. We let them all off the hook, many of the officials in the Kwangtung army, many of the officials that were involved with these war crimes later went on to work for America in the biological weapons area of the Korean War, including the commander of Unit 731, Hiro Ishii. And this is one of the reasons why the Chinese to this day hold a lot of animosity. The Kwangtung army was sort of let off the hook. And the Kwangtung army also helped establish the puppet state of Manchuria, where some of the most brutal biological warfare was waged in the history of humankind. I would argue the worst biological warfare. The Kwangtung army in Unit 731 used these bombs made of porcelain filled with fleas infested with the plague, and they're still coming across them. They believe that the Kwangtung army had 10,000 surrendered Chinese soldiers along the river and that they bound their hands and they personally beheaded every single one of them. The Kwangtung Army, Unit 731, all that was in the same province that many of these people who were buried here and who were later brought back, it is probably the most brutal chapter of human history, I would argue.